Let's get one thing straight. Bill 43 is about as bilious as a bill can get. <laughs> bilious. It's ugly. I'm standing before you as a Vancouver City Councilor, and there's nothing I want more than for you to have the right to toss me out if I'm not voting for the kind of transportation options that you want. It's what you should do, it's what your obligation is to do, and it's our obligation to listen to that voice. This bill takes that voice out of your mouth, it strips it away from you, hides it behind a closed door where no one, no one is accountable for what happens. Let's say you had, for instance, a mayor who had promised to freeze fare taxes and then didn't do it, then you could vote that mayor out of office, <laughs> for instance. <laughs> but you don't have that right now. You, you can still vote that mayor out of office if you choose to, but, but you don't have that right anymore. I, I have to tell you a little story about Kevin Falcon. About a year ago, I was at a meeting, the Lower Mainland uh, Association of uh, Municipalities, Local Governments, and Kevin Falcon was our speaker, and that audience was a very divided audience, and he was talking about Gateway, and about two-thirds of the folks there were on the other side of the river, and about one-third on this side, so we had a pretty friendly crowd. So he told a story with great energy. This guy speaks with tremendous energy. And he told a story about having just come back from China. He said, in China, if they want to build a bridge or a dam, they say, let's build a bridge or a dam, and they go out, and two weeks later, they put the shovel in the ground. He says, none of this public consultation. None of this environmental monitoring and reviews, you just do it. And you know what he said then? He said, China's my perfect ideal place. He says, China is like Falkenland. He actually said that. <laughs> well, let me tell you something, Minister Falcon. British Columbia is not Falkenland. Thank you. It's a tribute to and acknowledgement of, again, a corporate agenda. These particular political personalities, all pervasive rationality, persuasive to none but the solely money-minded, has made my blood run with reactive rage. I find that stomach trip. Head flip, reading page upon page of the plagiarized script, well equipped with an ancestry of hypocrites behind them now. Open eyes, never blinded, see, colonize and commercialize our synonyms for themselves and sin in men. Some swimming in the struggle, some floating on top, sipping in the brief bit of sweeter exploitation. Not about to step off, but let me repeat, it'll be brief, cause the earth she won't take much more. You don't make much public money making everyone poor. Eventually, economy will smack the floor, crack, and let our light pour in. And we'll be dancing all the more for revival of a real democracy. Uh, cause this one's nearly dead. Feed the earth with death so it can grow life through sacrifice. Sacrifice. Night into day, day into night, blending into the sacrifice. Uh, so strategy number two is strategically expand supply of transportation to provide real alternatives to driving alone. So this is talking about expanding our transit options um, so that everyone has the option uh, to take transit instead of uh, driving alone. And I see the first comment coming in from Mr. Becker and then I'm going to look around the room and note who else wants to speak. Uh, there's two things I would like to put forward. One is that the cycling infrastructure design and delivery be so good that drivers want to leave their cars at home and cycle instead for the next trip or combine cycling with transit. The second one is there should be a metro-wide comprehensive cycling network system providing cyclists with comfortable passage to any destination within Metro Vancouver and the adjoining region. Commuter cycling networks designed for trip efficiency with physical separation both horizontally and vertically should be implemented within Metro Vancouver based on origin destination trip patterns. Thank you. Ms. Garcia. Thank you. I'm with the, can you hear me? Speak into How's the microphone that? a little bit more. Yeah. That's How's good. that? I'm with the Access Transit Users Advisory Committee. Um, I think it would be useful if TransLink would respond to people's evolution of living and working hours with the ideas of possibly 24-hour SkyTrain service, expanding the bus services, shuttle, handy dart, and C-Bus service hours. 
Thank you. And this I, has to be put in the context of, of, of the last century where we massively over-invested in highway and road infrastructure with almost no in investment in the alternatives, transit and, and cycling. And that's why we, why we are where we are today. We made it really easy for people to drive and made it really impossible to, for them to choose other modes. So really what we need is, I would say, more of a massive investment in transit and cycling and follow the lead of, of France today. Uh, I think it was all over this weekend. They announced their green plan and Nicolas Sarkozy, the conservative uh, president of France, announced a, a freeze on road and airport construction. So I think we'd be well advised to follow that lead. Yes, Eric Doherty, Society Promoting Environmental Conservation. Um, I want to talk about this word strategically because I think that that is the key here. Uh, it's not just about willy-nilly increasing the supply of transportation because we've seen in the past that doing that is actually counterproductive uh, environmentally, socially, and economically. Um, I'd like to say that one of the most strategic things that TransLink could do is something that TransLink has already identified, which is to create a real frequent transit network. Um, and this is something that we need to link all of the regional town centers and along the key corridors in the region. Uh, I'd like to point out that a lot of these key corridors, such as the King George Highway, um, are already slated to have rapid transit, such as the King George Busway. And that is actually really the key to this strategy. Things like busways that give transit real priority over the private automobile. And so I think if we're, if we're talking strategically, we're talking about effective transit priority that increases the capacity of our road network without expanding the size of our road network. Uh, Taylor Curran. Um, I was just saying um, to provide transport for a greater proportion of people, um, I think we need to consider uh, other modes um, like bus rapid transit um, because although the SkyTrain is very effective at moving people. It's very expensive. For example, uh, the Canada Line is costing about 150 million per kilometer, whereas you can get uh, bus rapid transit systems that are costing 20 million or 30 million a kilometer. And I think we need to we need to uh, think about that option to um, reach the greatest number of people, because although um, the SkyTrain is efficient, uh, it, it, you can't possibly build a SkyTrain everywhere, it would just be too expensive and it's about getting transit to as many people um, in a frequent way so that everyone has an option of taking transit as opposed to driving. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Peter Holt, uh, Vancouver Board of Trade. I also note that we sort of gravitate into single issue solutions and we, we love to demonize the single occupancy vehicle. And we laud, as we've heard today, uh, you know, bicycling. I like bicycling, keen cyclist, uh, and also walking. Um, it's essential that we understand that, that even if we are enormously successful and we increase our transit use by a staggering amount, there is still a role for private cars, and we must recognize that. This is not about driving private cars off the streets. It's about putting together the very, very best transit system that we can afford and to share it throughout the region in the most equitable way. Thank you. We, we're tending, I hear, a lot of glorification that, well, we haven't built any road, any more big roads, good for us. Well, drive across the, the, port, the um, Oak Street Bridge and after you've come off the freeway, let's say you're, you're from the United States, and you end up on a, what is a glorified residential street. That's Oak Street. What are you going to do in 29, 2010 when the fire games and the Olympics are here or 20 or 30 years from now? Are you still going to dump people on the small streets like that? I think we need to think even more widely 
And look, folks, we're going to have to build some more roads, whether we like it or not. We're not going to get away with not doing that. I don't say we should do it willy-nilly. But I think particularly for the some 700,000 people across the other side of the bridge that people in the Burrard Peninsula don't think about, you're going to have to re retune your vision for what should be placed on that side of the river. Thank you. Okay, thanks for your comments. Jenny Ku. Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm from Churchill Secondary School, and I just like to say that I agree that we should, um, instead of just expanding the supply of transportation, but also increase the efficiency of our transportation. I do know that um, many people are discouraged from taking public transportation because of the long commute time. Like for me, if I go to school, by bus, it would take me about half an hour, but if my mom drives me on her way to work, it will only take me 10 minutes. So perhaps by increasing the amount of express buses available, um, it would encourage more kids to take the bus instead of um, getting a ride. Deb Jack, once again, um, I have met people in White Rock, so Surrey area, who are going to be driven to using their own cars once again, because Transnic has announced that Number of the buses frequently used by people for a very long time, such as the famous number 351, are going to be shut down, except insofar as taking people to the RAV line, Canada line and going into Vancouver on a rigid line. Now that means that all of the seniors, who for example aren't as mobile as youngers, will have to go onto a bus over to the Canada line, onto Canada line, then go off and get onto another bus. That's three moves instead of one. And they're saying that they're not going to be able to do that. They'll have to go to their cars. I used to work for TransLink. And when you work for TransLink, you mustn't say anything because you have elected politicians who do that for you. When you are a professional, you are not there to make policy. You're there to give policy advice. And that's very, very important. Civil servants are not supposed to run things. Don't tell Ken DeBell that because he'll get very upset. Because what happened, the reason why Kevin Falcon got so upset was that he wanted to build the Canada Line and the GVTA board, sorry, the TransLink board, you know, your mayors, your elected representatives said, but that's not in our plan. And he got very upset about that. Um, it was actually a bit embarrassing because the guy who invented the Canada Line was actually Ken DeBell. And he was the guy who forced it through against everybody else saying what a rotten idea it was. But the, reason that, but the reason that Ken DeBell thought it was a good idea was that he could sell it, not to the public, but to the private sector, because he managed to get on board with the airport. And the airport, you may remember, once upon a time, belonged to the people of Canada. Yeah, it was. It was a federal facility, which meant that our federal government, the people that we elected, ran the thing, just like the port. You know, the Port of Vancouver, that was reported to Transport Canada, which is a department of the federal government, the people that we vote for. And what happened was that the port and the airport were given to the private sector to run. They already have unelected boards. And if any of you are unhappy about what's been happening at your airport or what's been happening at the port, now you know why because they don't have to report to you. They don't have to tell you what they're doing or why they're doing it. They just have to make sure that their pay packets get bigger. And their pay packets get bigger because they're growing and they're winning more and more trade. Now that means you've got more planes flying over you. That means you've got more ships parked out there polluting your atmosphere about which we can do absolutely nothing at all. But don't worry about that because the guys who run the port are doing really well out of it. And these are the guys who dreamed up the Gateway Program. These are the guys who sat down with the Board of Trade and said, hey chaps, we've got a really good idea, why don't we widen the freeway? Now that's not in the plan either. We have a thing called the Liverpool Region Strategy. And we voted for that back in 1995. And there is a piece of legislation, just like Bill 43, called the GVTA Act, that says the Board of TransLink has to follow the regional growth strategy. And that's all they were doing. In fact, if they hadn't been upsetting TransLink, they would have been breaking the law. They had to tell Falcon that he wasn't doing it right. And that's why he wants to get rid of them. Because 
for the first time since I've ever worked for any public body, a bunch of politicians found some backbone and started saying, just a minute, we don't think this is a good idea. And they, it took three efforts before they managed to force that Canada line through. That's what upsets Kevin Falcon. That's why he comes up with ideas like, let's put barriers on Skytrain. He didn't go and ask anybody here if that was a good idea. If he'd done that, there are professionals who work for Translink. He says, let's have a professional board for Translink. Well, we're already paying for professionals at Translink. There are engineers, there are economists, there are planners, there are even accountants. And we actually spent quite a lot of time looking at questions like, shall we put gates on Skytrain? And we've been telling people over and over again for years and years and years, it will not pay for itself. But Kevin knows better. Kevin went to London. Kevin spoke to someone in London who'd never been to Vancouver, doesn't know anything about our system. So Kevin came back and said, I've got a good idea. We're going to put gates on Skytrain. And not only that, I'm going to give you money to do it, he said. He won't give us the money to buy more Skytrain cars. We've never had enough Skytrain cars since the day the thing opened. If we had enough Skytrain cars to use the capacity that we have on the bridge to Surrey now, that would be the equivalent of 10 lanes of freeway. That's why we've been saying all along, you don't need to double the, twin or the, the highway. You do not need to twin the Portman Bridge. We have the capacity there now. You just have to use it properly. You could run buses across the Portman Bridge now. You don't need to build a freeway to run a bus. All you need is a queue jumper, just like we've had at the Massey Tunnel for the last, what, 10, 15 years? Works perfectly well there. I don't see why it can't work on Portman Bridge. It's this kind of idea that Kevin Falcon doesn't want to hear. It's this kind of thinking that Kevin Falcon gets upset by, because it's founded on the basis of detailed, careful examination. It's based on rationality and facts, and we don't like facts getting in the way when we work for the BC Liberal Party. But I would much rather see a directly elected body responsible to the voters, so that every three years we get to say, actually we'd like to see a few more buses, please. We don't think we need any more bridges or any more highway expansion. What we would like is actually to be able to get on a bus rather than watch 15 go past us packed to the doors. And I think that kind of thinking is the thing which Kevin Falcon finds so offensive, because what he thinks is that if we get to vote for things, then he, won't be, he and his friends won't get an opportunity to make quite so much money. And isn't that going to be a shame? What you think of them because it's what you think that's important, it's what you say that's important. Not what they say in Victoria, not what they say inside the Board of Trade. It's what the people say that matters, because that's where the power resides, with the people. And it's up to us to show them that we are as mad as hell and we're not going to take it anymore.